about time to get started tonight. We're continuing our study uh, on the mindset of liberalism, which I believe is a very important study because we have to understand how people think. Why are they uh, thinking and believing the things that they think and believe and practicing the, the things uh, that they practice? And so, um, before we get started, uh, I'd like to ask, um, well, I'll just lead us in a word of prayer. Great God and Father, we thank you for this day and for all blessings. We thank you so much for your grace and mercy and the gospel message and the sending of your Son to the earth so that we might be saved. Pray to God that you will... Forgive us of our sins and help us to, to be compassionate and be merciful and to forgive those who sin against us. Help us also, Father, to be bold, to speak the truth in love, to always be willing to confront error in the spirit of love. We pray for our number, those who are sick. Pray for those who are spiritually sick. We pray that they'll repent and come back to us. Pray that you'll bless us in all our efforts. In all things, your will be done. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you look up here on the board, for those who were not here last week, this drawing here <clears throat> represents a mountain and a plateau. On either side, you have dangerous rocks, uh, sharp, pointy rocks that are detrimental to anyone who would fall upon them. What this represents is where truth is, the truth of God's Word. And we talked about it last week, how important it is that we remain in the truth that we don't want to go to either extreme. The extreme over here is binding methods as law. That's where you make a law where there is no law. And our brethren in the past, and even currently, some of them are guilty of doing that very thing. By saying you can't support an orphan home. You can't use multiple cups in worship in the Lord's Supper. Binding a particular method as a law, that is wrong. That's adding to God's Word. There, that's saying there is a law of God where there really is no law. That's one extreme we don't want to go to. The other extreme is liberalism. Loosing what God has bound in His truth. And we don't want to go that extreme either. We want to stay on the plateau of truth. I believe the majority of uh, the brethren that are not abiding in the truth are going this direction rather than this. This is a problem that needs to be dealt with when we come to it from time to time. But the problem we're facing now in Churches of Christ is going this direction, falling off the cliff into liberalism. Now, some brethren are not full blown over the edge, but they're getting very, very, very close. And it's a, a slow, progressive thing. And if it's not uh, corrected, it will lead to spiritual disaster, just as if you fall off either end of that plateau would uh, result in physical disaster. So we want to remain and abide in the truth uh, of God's Word. What we're doing is we're looking at an email uh, exchange in which we're talking about the, uh, the problem of uh, authority. We've looked at this passage before. Look at Luke chapter 20. This is talking about authority. The religious leaders are asking Jesus about his authority. And they wanted to know by what authority he did these things. And he says, I'll ask you a question, and you tell me, then I'll tell you by what authority. He says, was the baptism of John from heaven or from men? And we know how it was. They got together, and they basically said, well, if we, if we go either way, we're in trouble. We're just not going to answer. We don't know. And he says, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. What Jesus Ask is a question we must ask of everything we believe and practice. Is it from men or is it from heaven? Is it according to 
Colossians 3 and verse 17, whatever we do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord. Is it from heaven or is it something that came up from men? As I mentioned last week, we're talking about the uh, Highland Oaks Church of Christ in uh, Dallas that put a big ad in the paper this past uh, spring in which they were inviting people to come to a Passover meal and to come to celebrate Easter. And the conversation that I got involved with, with their minister of outreach, and we've had a back and forth email discussion on, on some things. And as we started the email last week, he says that in essence he has been doing work like this for 23 years and there have been in his past misguided, well-meaning Christians who are talking to him and combating perceived error. In other words, it's not really error, but they see it as error. And they're well-meaning, but they're misguided. So, in my effort to go to him and ask them why or by what authority they would have an Easter service, I'm misguided in that. That's a misguided uh, effort to try to combat perceived error, he says. And he says God's word needs no such rescue from those who want to rescue the truth and we looked at passages to the contrary. Jude verse 3, contend earnestly for the faith. First uh, Peter 3 and verse 15, we're to be ready always to give a defense to everyone who asks us concerning the hope that is within us, both with meekness and with fear. So we have to be ready always to, to, to give an answer or to give a defense. And also Philippians chapter uh, 1 verses 16 and 17, Paul says, I am set for the defense of the gospel. So yes, the truth in wrong hands can do a lot of damage. That's why we're told to handle correctly the word of truth. There's a mishandling of God's word that's being uh, uh, done in our society and unfortunately among our brethren. Let us continue with this email and we'll make some scriptural, scriptural, scriptural applications to what he responds and what he says. He says, Highland Oaks continues to grow, bringing to faith and knowledge of Jesus those who did not know him or at best unfaithful in their spiritual walk. It's a congregation of about a thousand plus in the Dallas area. Surely that is each community of faith's role within the kingdom. Hopefully the brethren who worship at Roy City are focused on this agenda and are being led to that end. If, Sean, your quest was a sincere search for why and how, we, uh, we were looking to enlarge the followers of Jesus. Why and how? What I was asking, by what authority do you celebrate Easter? That's basically what I ask. And, and in essence, in the process of the conversation, which lasted about 15 minutes in his office, he told me I was wasting his time and my time. And he was basically ready for me to go. And so we had this email exchange back and forth. So their effort is to enlarge the followers of Jesus. How was that done in the Bible? How did the church grow? Word of mouth. Preaching. Teaching. They went everywhere preaching the gospel. There was not a celebration of some sort of pagan holiday to draw in crowds. They went out and they taught. They planted the seeds. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 talks about some plant, some water. God gives the increase. Talking about preaching the word. Their effort to have things like this and other things that they have, they have things like carnivals in which they try to reach the unchurched. That's what they say in their website. They're trying to reach the unchurched by having carnivals, things of that nature. But that's not how the, the early Christians did it. They went out and they taught people. They didn't use gimmicks. He says, if your misunderstanding of our efforts to reach the lost demonstrates a genuine desire to understand, instead of the typical misguided belligerence I've seen before, the typical misguided belligerence. As I said before, in this liberal mindset, they don't like to be questioned. They don't like to be questioned. 
in what they do. He says, then an investment of time and patience would be worthwhile. Instead, following the example of Jesus and Paul, I yield neither. Certainly the ministry staff and the shepherds of this older Dallas County congregation believe and know God's word authenticates our methods. Well, if it does, then why didn't he show me from the scripture the celebration of Easter? He didn't show me in the email. Here is book, chapter, and verse for why we celebrate Easter. If God's word authenticates our methods, as he says, where's the scriptural proof? That's all I went to him with. A Bible, a pen, and a piece of paper asking for it. And he got upset about it. But yet he says God's word authenticates our methods. What we do here at Roy City, to the best of our ability, and we're not perfect, we're, we're striving to be what God would have us to be, we can give a book, chapter, and verse for everything we do in worship. From the Lord's Supper, from our singing, from our gather to, gathering together upon the first day of the week, to our, our study of the scriptures, uh, to the doctrine that we teach, we can give. Here's the reasons why we do this. We meet upon the first day of the week because of Acts 20 and verse 7. That was the pattern of the first century. We give upon the first day of the week because 1 Corinthians 16, verse 1 and 2. We take the Lord's Supper because Jesus said, Do this in remembrance of me. And it was done on a weekly basis. We sing because of Ephesians 5, 19, Colossians 3, 16. See, I'm giving book, chapter, and verse for everything we do in practice to authenticate what we do here. Yet he says God's word authenticates their practice of celebrating Easter, but then gave no proof. You've just got to take their word for it. He goes on to say, It is my fervent prayer that you will seek and live out the mission of Christ as espoused in John's gospel, specifically chapter 20 and verse 21. Look at John chapter 20. In verse 21, Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you, as the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. Talking about their mission of going and spreading the gospel and establishing uh, congregations uh, throughout the Roman Empire. That's true. You see that fulfillment in the book of Acts. As the book of Acts is a historical book that records the first 30 years of church history, in which the book of Acts, you don't find the practice of Easter. They didn't use that method. And the church grew like wildfire throughout the Roman Empire. How? Through, through the celebration of pagan festivals? No. Through preaching the word and teaching and baptizing people into Christ. He goes on to say... Uh, for you, Sean, I offer a prayer of maturity, humility, and grace. And may the Lord Jehovah bless you with such. And that ends that email. Now I want you to notice this. He says I'm wanting to pray um, a prayer of maturity, humility, and grace. I need to mature. Well, I know that. We all need to mature spiritually. But here's their mindset. The mindset of liberalism. They're the mature ones. Those who believe like us, you're immature. You're immature for questioning their practice of Easter. You're immature for questioning what they do. You need to grow up and be like us. That's basically their mindset and their condescending attitude. We are the immature ones because we don't go along to get along. We don't go along with all of their programs and their carnivals and their Easter programs and their plays and skits and the things that they do. You're so immature for not doing that. They're the mature ones, they believe. But yet they cannot give book, chapter, and verse for what they do. And so it's that condescending attitude of, Maturity. You need to you need to grow up and stop being concerned of 
of whether it's authorized or not. Come on, that's so 1950s. Asking whether something's authorized. That's ridiculous. Grow up. That's basically what he's saying. And I have seen this mindset in other people. When I've talked to others in the past who are, are part of liberal congregations, and I, you know, you question what they do, and they say, you know, Sean, I used to think like you. But that was just so narrow. Just so narrow. So they have, they have broadened their thinking. Doesn't Jesus say something about something that's broad? In Matthew chapter 7, broad is the way that leads to destruction. So they, they are free thinkers. They're progressive. That's what they like to term themselves. Progressive. They're progressing. And if you're stuck over here trying to abide in the truth and not going over the edge, then you're just, you need to mature. You need to grow up. Well, I emailed him back and asked him two questions. Remember, earlier in the first email, we brought this out last week, he said that he does not have the time to dally with refuting spiritual ignorance. Talking about me questioning him. He doesn't have time to dally with people like us. And the spiritually ignorant, the, the, the claim to superior knowledge of truth, and the uh, clairvoyant church of Christer. He calls people like us. You're a clairvoyant church of Christer. He don't have time to dally with us. I emailed him a response to this, and here's what I said in the email. Are you praying that I become mature like you? Do you know the truth? That was my two questions to him. If I'm immature, is he the mature one? Should I become mature like him? And since he has this attitude against those who claim to know the truth, I wanted to know, do you, do you know the truth? Now remember, he doesn't have time to dally with us. Here's his response. This whole email is his response. Let me read to you the, the end of the email because it's significant. What he has in all these paragraphs are a series of questions to me. And here's what he says at the very end of the email. I expect and want no answers. These questions are offered for your consideration only. Romans 16:17 is a principle worth applying in our context so I bid you Godspeed as I turn away from you in further dialogue. Romans 16, 17. Let's look at that. He applies it in this context. Because I ask him those two questions. Should I become mature like you? Are you praying that I become mature like you? And do you know the truth? Romans 16 and verse 17. See, this study is on the mindset of liberalism. Romans 16 and verse 17, he says, I apply in this context. He said, I appeal to you, brethren, to mark or watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you have been taught and avoid them. Now, I don't think he's applying that to himself. Therefore, he's applying that to me. Because I ask him two simple questions. I am someone that people are to watch out for because I cause division and I create obstacles or a stumbling contrary to the doctrine and people are to avoid me. Yes. <laughs> right. 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 But, yeah, I see what you're saying. That, 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 right. That what, what I'm questioning him about, about what they believe and teach, and saying there's no scriptural authority for it, that's causing a division between me and him. Well, who caused the division? Is it me or is it him? 
Well, if he talks, talks about here in verse 17, contrary to the doctrine. Is this in harmony with the doctrine of Christ? So who's teaching something contrary to the doctrine of Christ? Those who celebrate Easter? And another thing. He contradicted himself in this last sentence. Or he, he did something that he didn't realize he, he was trying to do. He says, Romans 16, 17 applies to you. So I bid you Godspeed. Wait a minute. Those of you who know the old uh, King James Version language says in Second John, if you bid God speed to a false teacher, you are a partaker of his evil deeds. So he's calling me a false teacher on one hand and then wishing me God speed with the other. Funny you should mention the Catholics because we're about to talk about them here in just a moment. So, so he bids me Godspeed, which is uh, basically a type of, you know, best, wish, best wishes, a blessing type of thing. But at the first part of the sentence, he said I was a false teacher, teaching things contrary to the doctrine, and I should be avoided. And they're supposed to be the loving ones. They're supposed to be the ones dripping with love. And we're mean conservatives. And he says, I'm going to ask you in all these questions, but I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to have a dialogue. Who's open-minded and who's not? I don't want to have a dialogue with you. I'm turning away from you and from further dialogue. I'm going to ask you all these questions, but I don't even want to talk about it. They're just for you to think about. So he's, see, he's the mature Christian talking down to me, you immature Christian. You think about all these things. But don't talk to me about it anymore. Now, as far as the meeting that we had face-to-face, -face, when I went to him to talk to him before we had this email exchange, I went to his office and we talked to him. He was very nice to me at first. Very nice, was uh, very accommodating until started questioning and asking for authority. And I asked him, why would you celebrate Easter if it's not found in the New Testament since it's a Catholic holiday? And he says, there's a lot of things that we do that are Catholic. I said, what? I said, there's a lot of things we do that are Catholics. I said, could you give an example? He said, yes. Having elders. Having elders... An eldership in a congregation to him is Catholic. I turned to Philippians 1. I had the Bible with me and I showed him the organization of the church. Uh, Philippians 1 and verse 1, where Paul writes to the church at Philippi, all the saints in Christ who are in Philippi with the overseers and deacons. This is a long time before the Catholic church came into existence. This is by inspiration the apostle Paul wrote. He said, well, do you have elders there at Roy City? I said, well, no, not at this time. We don't have men that are qualified. And he kind of looked at me. I said, you do know that there are qualifications for elders given by the Apostle Paul. And that was puzzling to him. Of course, with this liberal mindset, qualifications aren't that big a deal. You don't have to worry about being qualified. He said, any time, he said, uh, <clears throat> any time that you have uh, a sign out front with something written on it, and you have an organizational structure, you're a denomination. He said, you're a denomination if you, if you have that. And so if you have anything out front written on it, even though it might say Church of Christ from Romans 16:16, 16, 16, and you're trying to organize yourself according to Philippians chapter 1 and verse 1, in his mind, that's a denomination. I asked him this question. I said, are there faithful Christians in all the denominations? And he said, yes. He said, in ours too. 
I said, I don't know about you, but I'm not a member of any denomination. And that's when he went into his thinking that any time you have an organizational structure and a name on a sign, you're a denomination. So that gives the background to this email. That gives that background. He says, I've got just a moment. He's responding to the two questions I asked him. Remember, are you praying that I become mature like you, and do you know the truth? That was my two questions. He says, uh, he's just got a moment to, to, to email me, and he says, you asked while in my office uh, that I believe there were Christians living out their faith within the context of other Protestant denominations. So that word other, it implies the Church of Christ as a denomination. When you say other denominations, when you just talked about the Lord's Church, that's an, you're, you're implying the Lord's Church is a denomination. That's why we've got to be careful in saying that. But he believes the Church of Christ is a denomination. He says, Did you ask me if I believe that there were Christians living out their faith within the context of other Protestant denominations. Not your exact wording, but the question you ask nonetheless. Without hesitation, my response then and now is, of course, that's my belief. Of course they are. And he's going to go on to explain. With Jesus and his word as the author of my faith, I certainly believe that any Christian who change, or excuse me, any person who changes his or her sinful lifestyle and obediently follows God's command to be immersed into Christ, Romans 6 and verse 4, is in fact a Christ follower. Period. Notice he didn't say be baptized for the forgiveness of sins. Just you're immersed to obey the Lord. If I or excuse me, if and I, if I rather think uh, your question, as your question did come, if you're inquiring where I, whether I believe individuals who are not members of the, quote, Church of Christ, unquote, or are not immersed by a member of the, quote, Church of Christ, unquote, should be viewed as the member, as members of the biblical church for which Jesus died, was buried, and was resurrected for, but have obediently accepted his saving grace, Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, again, my answer is yes. So, in a nutshell, what's he saying? A person can be taught denominational doctrine, and as long as they believe in Jesus, they can become a Christian. They can become a Christian in the context of being within a particular denomination, being taught that denomination's doctrine. Let's prove that to be absolutely false. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1. Verse 22 and 23. <clears throat> Remember Luke 8 and verse 11. Jesus said the seed is the word of God. The seed is the word of God. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 22. He's talking to Christians. He says, having been purified, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere uh, brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Verse 23. Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. So what Peter is saying here, you have purified your souls, you have been saved in obedience to the truth. You can't be taught denominational error and become a Christian. Because they don't teach the truth, by definition, on the plan of salvation. Because of that, they become religious. They become a part of that religious body that they're baptized into, whether it be Methodist or Baptist or Pentecostal or Lutheran, on and on you could go. But they have not obeyed the truth of God's Word because the truth of God's Word produces nothing but a Christian and collectively produces nothing but the Lord's Church if we're to believe that every seed reproduces after its kind. Jesus said the seed of the kingdom is the word of God. Luke 8 and verse 11. But this liberal mindset that has abandoned the truth and has gone over the edge says 
Well, there's such good people in those denominations that do so many good things. And so their emotions get involved, and so they have to ignore the truth, and they want to accept them, accept those people as brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, let me read this uh, second paragraph, and then we'll go into a discussion here. He says, do you believe, Sean, that God only considers those to be in his family who are on the, quote, official Church of Christ, unquote, roles? You see how he has this almost disdain for Church of Christ. It, that's a common characteristic among liberal, liberal thinkers. Is the current New Testament church only that one which has the present day name Church of Christ? He's got that in quotes. By the way. Romans 16, 16 is in the Bible. The churches of Christ greet you. That's long before any of us were around. Or, do the, or does the ecclesia, the Greek word for church, consist of all those who have obeyed the gospel in any age of the world or in any place of the world? If not, why not? And after one obeys the gospel, how much time does God give a new believer to study him or herself out of misconceptions and imperfections? in perfect knowledge before said individuals become, quote, lost, unquote, again. Do you believe that saved believers, you do believe that saved believers can fall from grace, don't you? That word fall is in quotes. I wonder if he does. Galatians 5 and verse 4, the Apostle Paul said you can fall from grace. Is it possible for a person anywhere in the world to be a Christian without having his or her name on the official, quote, Church of Christ, unquote, role? Is it possible for a church to have the name Church of Christ and not be scriptural? Yeah, it sure can. What errors would make such a congregation unscriptural? The use of instrumental music? taking the Lord's uh, Supper quarterly, no elders, misapplying the Scriptures, attitudes of self-importance, etc. So he keeps talking about the official Church of Christ role. And you have to understand, in this liberal mindset, they believe that the Church of Christ is a denomination that got its start in the early 1800s by Thomas and Alexander Campbell, and it's just a denomination like the Baptist or the, the Lutheran or the Pentecostal or the Methodist. And so there's nothing unique about it. So they can talk about it with disdain almost as though it's just an unnecessary institution because you can go out here and you can live a faithful Christian life as a Baptist. Who keeps the roll book concerning those who are saved? Who does that? God, Christ. Look at Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20 and verse 12. God is the one that keeps the roll book. He said, I saw the dead, the great and small, stand before the throne, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they have done. He says in verse 15, And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. God is the one that keeps the books. Now, just because my name is on the Roy City Church of Christ directory doesn't mean I'm going to heaven if I don't live a faithful Christian life. Look at uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 19. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 19. Paul says to Timothy, <clears throat> But God's firm foundation stands, ha ha bearing this seal. The Lord knows those who are His, and let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. The Lord knows those who are His. God knows. Like Jesus said in John chapter 10, My sheep hear My voice, and they follow Me. Question, can we know who is following Christ? Can we know who is doing the will of God? Well, you just compare what they do and what they teach with the Word of God. 
That's what you do. And so he, he, he's trying to say, you, you believe that you've got to have Church of Christ on the sign or it's, it's not an official Church of Christ. I've never taught that. There are many various scriptural phrases to describe the Lord's church. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 2, Paul writes to the church of God. And so you have the temple of God, you have the kingdom of Christ, you have the body of Christ, you have the church of the firstborn, and on and on you can go with scriptural descriptions of the church that can be put on the sign. But churches of Christ have a reputation. That's why some of them who have this liberal mindset want to drop of Christ off their sign and just be called a church. They don't want to be known as a church of Christ. The, the reason why is because of the reputation. About six months ago, Jennifer and I, probably longer than that, we were looking into getting a new computer. And uh, uh, we were at Best Buy in Mesquite, and we were talking to the salesman there. And we were telling them for what reason we needed this computer to help us do research and such. And she teaches math, and I'm a preacher. And he said, well, it has all these features on it that you could, uh, you know, have music and all these things. He said, what church do you preach for? I said, the Roy City Church of Christ. He says, oh, you don't have instrumental music. Now, he wasn't a member of the church. But why did he know that? Because of the reputation that we, generally speaking, do not use instrumental music. There is a reputation that goes along with Church of Christ. Never said that it has to say Church of Christ on the sign. But there's a reputation there because brethren have, generally speaking, in our country and in our culture, have identified the Church of Christ with a return to New Testament Christianity. You certainly don't find Methodist Church or Baptist Church or Lutheran Church as a name given to God's people. And he says, is it possible for a church to have the name Church of Christ and not be scriptural? Yes. And I believe Highland Oaks is an example of that. Not trying to be unkind. This goes into, with the time we have remaining, a parting statement I had to him before I left his office. He had been kind of pacing back and forth and ready for me to get out as I was sitting there asking questions. I said, you could probably suggest this to your elders. Could you please consider taking of Christ off your sign and just call yourself the Highland Oaks Church like they did in Oak Hills in San Antonio where Max Licato preaches? They just call themselves now the Oak Hills Church. And that was the parting suggestion I gave as I left. Here's what he says in the email about it. While in my office you diversively refer to the Christians who worship in the community at Oak Hills Church in San Antonio. In San, at, in San Antonio. My assumption based upon experience with individuals of your ilk. Individuals of your ilk. Now, that's something nice to say. Ilk is your, your, how do you even describe that word? I didn't even look it up. Well, he's talking about me. Based upon experience with individuals of your ilk, is that you do not condone or accept Max Licato or James Dobson or Bill Hybels or Billy Graham as capable of teaching biblical truths and therefore reject them as heretical. All the men that he spoke of are capable of teaching biblical truths, but they don't. They don't. They're capable. I wish I had half the ability that Max Licato has. But just because they teach some truth and they mix it with a lot of denominational error doesn't make them okay. Yes, they're capable, but they simply don't. 
Then he asked this question, Sean, which of the following men would you not allow if they, still, they were still living to preach at the Roy City Church of Christ? Thomas Campbell, Alexander Campbell, Barton W. Stone, Moses Lard, David Lipscomb? What does that matter? If they don't teach the truth, they shouldn't be allowed to preach anywhere. If they're not preaching the truth, there's a lot of things when you study Thomas and Alexander Campbell that I strongly disagree with. We don't owe their alle our allegiance to them. But what you have to understand, and we'll close with this thought, in this liberal mindset, there is a strong allegiance to people. Just like you find in the denominational world, there's a strong allegiance to religious founders. That's why they call themselves Lutherans after Martin Luther. That's why they call themselves Calvinists after John Calvin. And that same denominational mentality is found in liberalism. There's a strong allegiance to what Thomas and Alexander taught or what David Lipscomb said. And they, that's a big deal to them. And I've studied some of their things and, and taught a little bit of restoration history, but I made it very clear in the class we don't owe those men any allegiance. They were great men who did some great things, but our allegiance is to Christ and to His Word. And if Thomas and Alexander Campbell and Barton Stone were wrong on anything, David Lipscomb was wrong on anything, they were wrong. Yes. Acts 12, 4. Let me see here. Okay. In the King James Version, let me just read the verse. And when he had seized him, he put him into prison, delivering him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after Passover to bring him out to the people. In the old King James, the 1611 edition, they translated, translated this word, which means Passover, Pascal, I think is the word in Greek, as Easter. And that's just a misfortune in, in the King James Version. The New King James has corrected that mistranslation. And all subsequent English translations from there have translated that word Passover. Easter didn't get its start till about the 400s. So if they get that, how do we say that? We just, uh, sh just show them all these different other translations or versions and say, here's what the scholars have done. They've corrected that mistake that was made in 1611. Because the, 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 the translators, for some reason, I, and I don't know offhand exactly the reason why they translated it Easter instead of Passover. Uh, but that's that was a mistake on their part. Just like in some passages, the Bible in the 1611 edition says Jesus went to hell when he died. Now, did Jesus go to the literal burning hell? No, he went to Hades. And that's why the English translations have updated. Instead of hell, it says Hades. Yes, yes. The word uh, Easter was uh, added to describe that word. Uh, there might be something to that. I believe so. Some words in Greek are hard to bring over into English. And so uh, that is a good point, though, to, to, to know. Because people will go to that in the King James Version and say, well, look, here, here is Easter. But when you look at the context here, it's talking uh, about the celebration of Passover. It could not be referring to Easter for the simple fact Easter did not exist in the first century. And so those 1611 translators are looking back on history and they're trying to translate a language and they put Easter where it should not. It's like later on, and we'll, we'll quit on this thought, later on in the book of Acts, when it's, when it's talking about Paul on the ship, it says they fetched a compass 
They fetched a compass when he was on that ship, when they were going through the storms. That's the old 1611 King James Version. What that means is they went around something. They circumvented something. They didn't go get a compass. Compass didn't exist in the first century. So language has to be understood within its context. We'll continue. Well, next week is singing. We'll have our singing service and we'll continue this discussion the following Wednesday.